So today's video, we're going to talk first of all about scientific notation and then something called dimensional analysis. So let's talk about scientific notation. Probably something you've seen before, but we're going to review it now. Scientific notation is just in the format of m times 10 to the nth, where m is just a number equal to or greater than 1. No. Yes. m is equal to or greater than 1 but it's less than 10, and n is an integer, a whole number either negative or positive, okay? So what scientific notation allows us to do is talk about really big numbers, really small numbers, or help clarify what numbers are significant and what numbers aren't. So when we look at taking decimals and turning them into scientific notation, what we're going to do is just look at turning this number here into a number between 1 and 10 by sliding the decimal point. And if we do that, we're going to end up with 2.34. So we're sliding the decimal to create a number between 1 and 10. Now we're going to add that times 10 to them, and we're going to ask ourselves, how many times did we slide the decimal? And it looks like we slid it three times. So that becomes our end value. Now, this can be negative or positive. Obviously, I'm dealing with a number that's less than 10, right? It's a small number. So that indicates that that exponent has to be negative 3. So if you think about 10 to the negative third, that negative third is telling you you're dealing with a number less than 10, right? You're sliding the decimal to the left. I never think about it as, hey, am I moving, moving the decimal left or right? I just know that this right here is a very small number. Therefore, well, it's small relative to 1. Therefore, the 10 to the x number has to be negative. That ne x has to be a negative because it's a small number. So let's kind of use that logic here. Oh, by the way, if this were on a computer, it would be shown as 2.3 4 e negative 3 okay you're gonna see that sometimes um, when we deal with our calculators e to a computer or a calculator mean means times 10 to the so these things are equal when we write it out we always write times 10 to the on a computer we write capital E to mean times 10 to the all right so this guy down here now let's take a look at him 5.7 times 10 to the fourth is that a big number or a small number? 10 to the fourth. That's a big number, right? You know it's 10 times 10 times 10 times 10. So we're going to take the 5.7. And the decimal is sitting here. We're going to move it four times, but we're no, we know we're creating a big number, so it's going to move to the right. One, two, three. Four. So now we've got 57,000. That's 5.7 times 10 to the fourth. All right, I've moved the decimal four times to the right. How did I know it has to be 57,000 and not 0. .00057? Again, 10 to the fourth is a large number. All right, let's take a look at this. 543,000. So our first step, we're going to take a number and turn it, I'm sorry, we're going to take the decimal and move it to create a number between 1 and 10. If we do that, we get 5.43. And then we ask ourselves, how many times did we move the decimal to get it there? Hmm. 1, 2, 3, 4, we moved it 5 times. So is this going to be a negative or positive? Five. The next thing I ask myself, well, 10 to the fifth is a big number, right? Hey, here's a big number. That would make sense that it's 10 to the positive 5 here. We're trying to create a large number. All right, next problem. 1.21 times 10 to the negative fifth. The negative fifth, what does that tell you? Does it sound like a lot? No, it's a small number. So now that means we have to slide the decimal five times over this direction. How's that going to look? 
Well, that would mean I'd have to have four zeros in front of it because it's going to take one jump just to get it to the other side of that one. So I'm going to go zero point and add four zeros. And then I'm going to write the number. So 0 0.00001. That would be 1.21 times 10 to the negative fifth. Yeah, that seems right. Okay. This guy right here, let's convert that to scientific notation in decimal form. Um, how many times do we have to slide the decimal to get it between 1 and 10? So it's we know it's 4.78. That's the number that's between 1 and 10. How many times did we have to slide that? So I come back here and I just count. All right, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's a seven. And because I'm dealing with a number less than one, I'm going to make that a negative. Again, 4.78 times 10 to the negative seventh, you know you're dealing with something much less than one. All right, next one. 3.1 times 10 to the 7th. I know that's a big number. If someone said, hey, would you like 3.1 times 10 to the 7th dollars? I'd be pretty happy. If someone wanted to give me 3.1 times 10 to the negative 7th dollars, that's not very much money. So we're going to slide the decimal seven times to the right. So the three, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that looks like about 31 million is 3.1 times 10 to the seventh. All right, woo, here's a really big number. 23 billion, huh? So we make a number between one and 10. 2.3 times 10 to the, and then we ask ourselves, how many times are we gonna move that decimal to make that 2.3? Three, six, nine, 10. It's a big number, so that exponent stays positive. 2.3 times 10 to the 10th. All right, last one here. 8.54 times 10 to the negative 2. We're simply going to be moving the decimal to the left two times. So 0 0.0854 is the same as 8.54 times 10 to the negative second. All right. So now what I'd like you guys to do is practice converting decimals to scientific notation or scientific notation to decimal form. And then I want you to come back and check your answers. So go ahead and do that for these eight problems. Pause it now, and then once you're finished, come back and check your work. Okay. So when do we use scientific notation? I so said there's times where we're talking about really large numbers, 3.6 times 10 to the 23rd or something like that. Maybe we're talking about the atoms in a sample. Or maybe we're talking about the distance between two atoms and we're dealing with like, you know, 3.7 times 10 to the negative 23rd meters. Um, sometimes we just use it to show the correct number of sig figs. So, for example, I know this is two sig figs right here, 1.2 times 10 to the negative 4th. Those numbers right there are the significant figures. The 10 to the 4th doesn't really matter. That's just telling me where the decimal is. So it takes the ambiguity out of this measurement here. It, I know that's really two sig figs because no decimal point is present, but this makes it absolutely sure that we, we're not missing a sig fig somewhere in there. Okay? The last concept we need to deal with in this unit is something called dimensional analysis. So what is dimensional analysis? Dimensional analysis is a mathematical system using conversion factors, equalities, to move from one unit of measure to a different unit of measurement without changing the value of the considered quantity. This is a really valuable skill for this class and any other science class that involves a lot of mathematics. So we're going to stress this now and we're going to see it pop up again and again throughout the whole course. So let's go ahead and take a look at what this is about. When I have equalities, I can turn them into something called conversion factors. So what do I mean by inequality? We know one foot is 12 inches. 
So because I know one foot is 12 inches, I can create two different conversion factors. 12 inches over one foot, or one foot over 12 inches. And what is the mathematical value of each of these fractions? So it's one thing divided by the exact same thing. So 5 over 5, 9 over 9, pi over pi, a chicken over a chicken. All of those things have to be equal to the idea of 1. So essentially, by multiplying by one of these conversion factors, I'm essentially multiplying something by 1. Thus, I'm not really changing its value. What's going to happen, though, is I end up changing the units that we're talking about. So, let's take a look at this particular problem. Given the fact that there's 12 inches in one foot, and there's 2.54 centimeters in one inch, how would I convert 3.23 feet into centimeters? So let's take a look here. I'm going to start with the quantity 3.23 feet. The units become very important. We always want to show our units. I'm going to set up this conversion factor next to it. And I'm going to use the idea that there are 12 inches in one foot by placing the 12 inches on one top on the top and the one foot on the bottom. The reason I'm doing that is because now I have feet in the numerator here. I have feet in the denominator here. So if I have feet in the numerator, I have feet in the denominator, they essentially cancel. Now all I have is inches. The feet have disappeared. I'm going to use this next conversion factor here by taking the 2.54 centimeters, putting that on top, and the one inch on the bottom. I'm not really concerned about the one or the 2.54. I'm really just looking at the units, the dimensions it's measured in. So now, inches cancel, and I have the units centimeters remaining. Well, it's kind of centimeters. It's better centimeters now. So 3.23 times 12 times 2.54 divided by the quantity 1 times 1 gives me 98.5, and the unit remaining is centimeters. You notice that I started with three sig figs. I'm finishing with three sig figs. These guys are really not significant. They're exact definitions. 12.0000 inches is 1.0000 feet. So I'm not really restricted by the sig figs in that particular operation. So you'll notice that whatever unit I have here ends up in the denominator of the next conversion so that they're canceling. Let's take a look at another example. How many seconds are there in 1.65 times 10 to the negative second weeks? So we start with our input value and then Obviously, this is over 1. I'm just not writing it over 1, but this is in the numerator. Um, I'm trying to get to seconds, so I'm going to convert my weeks, I guess, to days. There are 7 days in a week, so I'll put the 7 days on top and 1 week on the bottom. Now, my unit weeks, 1 in the numerator, 1 in the denominator, they cancel. So now I have the unit days. I want to convert days to hours, because I know there's 24 hours in a day. So the 24 hours will go in the numerator. So now I have days in this numerator and days in this denominator, so they cancel. So now I've got hours, I've got to convert that to seconds. 60 seconds in one minute. So how do I know which side everything goes on? How do I know the seconds are on top? Well, I'm paying attention to the units, again, because hours were in the numerator of the previous, I'm going to cancel them with hours by putting them in the denominator of the other one. And again, all of these are just equalities, so I'm not really changing the value of the initial measurement. And we end up with 166 seconds. All right, let's take a look at one more problem. These are actually true measurements. It's kind of a weird system, isn't it? 
given that one hogshead is 32 pecks, one peck is four pottles, four pottles is eight cups. I've heard of cups before, obviously. Hogsheads, meh. I actually have heard that measurement. Oh, pecks. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers, I'm pretty sure. Uh, but these are all kind of volume measurements. So how many hogsheads are in 1.25 times 10 to the third cups? If we think about that, we're sliding our decimal three times over, so this is 1,250 cups. Uh, I start with my input value, and I make sure I write my units down. All right. Now, let's just go exploring up here on how to do this. Where are cups? Okay, cups are right here, and they're attached to one pottle. Eight cups is one pottle. So the eight cups is going to go in the bottom, and the one pottle will go on top. Now, cups cancel. I've got pottles. Well, now I have another pottle here that's attached to pecs. Four pottles and a peck. So in this case, four pottles will go down here, and one peck will go up top, allowing me to cancel the pottles. Now I've got pecks in the numerator, so I'll use this 32 pecks over here, and I'll put the one hogshead on top, good old HH, my pecs cancel, and I'm left with the unit hogsheads, which works because I'm looking for hogsheads. And I get 1.22 hogsheads. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit more about how we do this on the calculator when we get together to make sure we're all on the same page. So let's take a look at one last example. All right, so this one might be made up. Three glips equals four flams. Six bloops is five flams, and two bloops are seven grobs. How many glibs are in 23.8 grobs? Ugh. So, we go up here and find our grobs. Seven grobs is two bloops. So the seven grobs will go in the denominator. Our two bloops will go in the numerator. Now, grobs cancel. I've got bloops in the numerator. So bloops is going to have to go in the denominator here. Up here, there's six bloops for every five flams. So the six bloops will go on the bottom to cancel my bloops. Put the five flams on top. And then, I've got flams here, so flams will have to go on the denominator. I'll use this one. Four flams to three glips. Oh, I forgot to cancel my bloops here. My flams cancel here. And now I've got the unit glips remaining. So, 4.25 glips. Okay, so that pretty much wraps up this unit. We'll meet you back to talk more about these particular problems and have a little practice. Sounds good? Yeah.